So um, with, with that and with my previous introduction, so I think I would be spared if I've not done any, you know, like all the things in very nice manner. Uh, and I realized, uh, you know, it, I think it, obviously it's, it's an overview of literally the chapters that are forthcoming in this book. So it's really uh, just a brushing up of, okay, you know, let's talk about an example, you know, these are the things. So this is what basically this whole chapter is about. And um, this might be a good idea to, uh, you know, have a conversation actually, instead of me presenting, I just kept very short points. Uh, and I was hoping that we, uh, you know, based on what everybody has read and based out of your experiences, you know, you know, those examples which resonate with what you have done, uh, would it would be an ex better, uh, in, instead of me just talking about, okay, you know, there was this example, there is Xbox survey, there is um, gun policies, you know, that is being talked about. Maybe if somebody has more context to it, I think, you know, that person should um, just jump in and uh, give their thoughts on that. Um, with that, let's, I guess, formally start with uh, chapter one overview for uh, regression and other stories. And can you all see my screen? Okay, great. So, um, so this, uh, you know, obviously the book is about uh, learning about regression and in talk, it talks about um, in the intro and then you know, all the following chapters are basically telling you uh, the details of uh, how to do causal inference using regression. Uh, and in the beginning, it, it talks about, or it brings up the three challenges that uh, statisticians face, uh, typically in, in terms of um, uh, inference. So, uh, the and, and they all pertain to uh, re uh, regression uh, methods in general, uh, you know, based on the scenario, the way it is used for. Um, so first one being, um, they mentioned that, generalizing from sample to population. So it is a problem associated with survey sampling mainly, but then it also arises in every other uh, application of um, statistical inference. And the example that they quote about uh, for, for this specific case is uh, when we are talking about, or we are modeling with a sample, uh, you know, gen to generalize the population saying, you know, we, uh, let's say we created a model from sample means and we we, we start predicting val things based off of that um, what would you do when uh, you know things that that you need so your test set basically contains something that the sample has not seen so that's um, that's basically what this um, issue is about so uh, not being able to predict something that was not observed before um, now, the second uh, thing that the, uh, the authors bring up uh, is, is talking about generalizing from treatment to control group. Uh, again, so it is a problem for causal inference because um, it, it implicitly or explicitly is part of the interpretation of the regressions that is seen. Again, same, uh, you know, we, that is what has been seen, I think, is the key according to me. Um, so if uh, there is a future treatment, which is which is different from the current treatment that we're talking about, I think then the same comparison will not apply or the same, you know, equation will not work um, uh, again. And following from that, um, they also mentioned that uh, generalizing from observed measurements to the underlying constructs of interest. This this point, third one, um, I'm, I'm not too sure, uh, you know, how to explain as such. Um, again, happy to have others talk about it. Um, uh, they they specifically mentioned that you know as most of the time our data do not record exactly what they would ideally like to study. So this is more uh, in in context of the st uh, interest studies, meaning um, I guess so if there is a specific point of interest that you are uh, trying to study, but if you're not able to consider all the factors that affect it, um, th that's a situation where it, it the analysis or the the regression results are not really, um, you know, in correct indicator of, uh, you know, like for example, the uh, fitting equation that you generate in, in the case where you don't have all the right predictors, then the model that you get, however good it may look on paper is, is not really, uh, you know, the right thing to uh, calculate your, uh, or predict your uh, outcome variable. Um, I guess I should pause. Uh, this is this is the first section. Um, any questions, or do we want to have any discussion? 
Okay. Uh, keep going then. Uh, okay, so section uh, two is about, uh, you know, why you want to learn regression. Uh, it, it starts with defining regression. So in, in the author's language, uh, regression is a method that allows researchers to summarize how predictions or an average value of an outcome would look like uh, based on the set of predictors. Uh, again, to further simplify this and, and coming in from a little bit from my economics background, I want to, uh, you know, I, I want to also give in my own definition or how I understand, I always understood regression is, it is, regression is, is a methodology of defining a relationship between one and more variables. Now, the first one when I'm, when I'm saying, how is this, how can this variable be uh, represented as an, um, you know, as a mathematical, in a mathematical form, using some other variables that we already know. Um, and again, in theory, there are many, many names for these. You have this, this one is called, uh, it's called the result. It could be outcome. This is your dependent variable. And then uh, all the, the ones that are helping, or, you know, the predictors which are helping define it or helping calculate this uh, variable are, um, they're called predictors. They're called independent variables. Um, and many more names. So um, coming back to the definition that I was mentioning. So how can I um, find out or how can I predict um, a variable using, which is unknown, uh, uh, you know, using things that are known. So using the knowns and the combination of them, uh, those, uh, you know, those values to predict um, the unknown variable. I hope this helps. <laughs> Um, okay, now again, so this uh, this section basically highlights uh, lots of different uses of regressions, like, you know, where are, what are those um, high-level uh, scenarios where you can use uh, regression as a methodology. Um, the first one being prediction, which for me is, is most common, um, maybe not for everybody else. Um, so what prediction means is you're you're modeling your existing observations or you're forecasting new data. So you you uh, you take a sample or you take the observed um, uh, records that you have. You train your data uh, based on those, and then you know you come up with um, a line of best fit, and you uh, based on that line of best fit, you then can use uh, you know the. Uh, the known values of the predictors to predict the unknown. Um, in uh, this is typically and most commonly based off of the least sum of least square methodology, um, and uh, I'm talking about linear regression, uh, which is the first part of this, where my um, predictor, my outcome variable, is continuous or approximately continuous. Um, some of the examples being um, what is going to be the sales of a product or um, let's see, so how many, what is going to be the voting share in an upcoming election or uh, I don't know if there are more examples people want to talk about. Um, then a uh, second scenario is uh, logistic regression, uh, a very common example. Actually the, the, actually, the right word would be classification. Logistic regression is one of the ways of doing it. Um, and in, in most simple words, it is when, you know, you're trying to, um, you're, you're looking at either a dichotomous variable or a categorical variable with very few limited values or a multi-class classification as also known as. So you want to find out whether this event is going to happen or not. So, you know, disease diagnosis, uh, victory in a, in a betting event or uh, individual voting decision. Um, so this is one uh, one one of the more uh, you know common ways uh, regression is used. Uh, some other ways are uh, like exploring associations, which uh, means that summarizing how well one variable or a set of variable can predict the outcome. Um, again, there are uh, many examples uh, talked about uh, in the book. I probably should have cut down on the content, but still if in case one wants to refer. Um, so for, uh, I think I like this example where this, they bring up the, you know, uh, finding the association between the pollution levels and disease incidents. So um, uh, basically we are trying to understand how the, you know, one, one or more variables are going to uh, impact the, um, the outcome variable. So uh, in my mind, it still is very similar to uh, prediction per se, because 
you know using the association uh, understanding is is something that i think you can build prediction um but again i think i i'm, I'm not uh, sure if that's the way to go or that that's my understanding um, please help me correct if i'm wrong um next uh, point that they bring up uh, that the re regression is used for um, is extrapolation where you want to adjust for known differences between the samples um and and there are a few examples uh, in the book in the following sections that i think would be good to um, discuss uh, and um, also i think this is another important one is the causal inference which means um comparing the out uh, outcomes for the treatment or control or with multiple treatments in uh, and, and i think people from healthcare would have some um, like live examples for for those cases um one of the uh, examples like you know the education study that it mentions here i was part of in crat school uh, when i was an ra was my uh, team uh, was an educa higher education team and what they were really working on was they they wanted to see if they can um, create impact by introducing different um, uh, kinds of experiments and for the middle schoolers and if they could help bring the um, uh, would you say affinity towards science increase the affinity towards science in in all the candidates uh, that they were working with in uh, Waltham middle schools so that study again uh, was was you know was would fall into this category where they were trying to see so all they do experiments with uh, with, with those uh, middle school students every uh, two twice a year and then they do surveys pre and post and then they uh, analyze if they were able to you know bring any uh, like if they were able to increase that science affinity of in in those kids uh, before and after the experiment but and then they continue to the the experiment as such was a three year and nih funded um, experiment uh, with a larger goal of you know increasing the science affinity and the experiments that they were doing were they were based on different themes so um, once it was done with um, um, like heat was the theme or, or the science topic that they did next time it was music and then uh, the third one that i was part of was um uh hydroponics so you know making uh, growing plants uh and measuring the things that are needed to for for a plant to grow in a healthy way um so that's about the examples and the uh, uh, you know, bigger discussion on why you want to use regression and what are some of the scenarios. And I think I should shut up for now. There was a long one. Any questions, discussions? Okay. And I guess the next of the next few sections, I'm just going to rush through because they were just examples. I guess we have all um, looked into them. So I just brought them up uh, just I don't know, just for the namesake, and uh, I want to see if we we really need to discuss them. Like, if I need to talk about those examples, or anyone has any um, specific question, any discussion, do we want to have on these? So the Xbox survey, uh, Priyanka, why is that an extrapolation? Um, it was mentioned uh, in within the text, right? So they, uh, because this, uh, what they were doing in Xbox survey wasn't really meant for any, um, uh, what do you say? So what the text said was this survey was done, they, they did it for the purpose of, um, what's that word? Um, to, to uh, bring adjustments to what they were observing earlier. So there were reports in media which they wanted to sort of, um, you know, match up in, in that sense that what they are, what their respond, uh, what their users are, you know, how are they really feeling about it? And they wanted to understand, because, you know, if you, if you remember reading the example, they were like, I don't know, 700 and so there was this large uh, data set that it very, very initially, you know, it mentioned, so these many, uh, respondents were there and which is you know a large data set and it begins with saying that statement so uh, so any prediction of uh, what the survey response would be was not their aim uh, 
uh making any claims or making any predictions was not what they wanted to do but what they really wanted to do was to understand how to adjust uh, their samples or how to adjust the results uh, or of the surveys uh, in order to understand um, in uh, in order to understand the uh, results in a right way uh, basically because of uh, uh, the other media reports that they were seeing they wanted to sort of just match um and again like i said so since uh, this large the survey uh, sorry sample of respondents was large um it it was not representative of the entire population so according to you know what this what what, what was given in this example was i think they wanted to sort of address the um, imbalancing if that's the for lack of right word so they wanted to sort of account for everyone who um who who is a xbox user but probably was not being surveyed so i think i think they get into that in chapter 17 where they look at the post stratification and missing uh, data imputation or yeah, something like yeah, that yeah a lot of yeah i think uh, you know towards the end of every examples that they have discussed they mentioned you know that in detail this topic will be covered in chapter 6 or chapter 11 so yeah even the i think the calculation part right the last section where it says calculating least squares and it says it starts to use uh, that brms package and those uh, stand functions um yeah and then there is one line where it says you can also do it with lm if that makes you comfortable <laughs> and uh, yeah but this will the bayesian thing will be discussed in xyz chapter so i was like okay hi i think i that's why i appreciated the tidy models idea or i would probably do the lm way which i the only thing i know all right um okay again so um it the next section talks about challenges in building understanding and interpreting regressions which i think i somehow felt that you know is also talked about in in the previous ones uh it again brings up different examples and uh focusing on the causal inference piece it says you know again within what we already discussed uh, there are two things that you um, uh, generally people tend to do when they're using regression for causal inference which is um you know you're trying to estimate a relationship which again seems like prediction to me and then you're adjusting for background variable which is uh, what was sort of mentioned in the other two uh, uh, subsections earlier um so then i think these probably i could go back to the text and we can we can talk about this um i, I just you know sort of had to uh, quickly browse through them uh let's see we can go to the text let me see quickly uh yeah this piece uh, again i can talk about this a little bit um so in this section uh, again this is in a way uh, part you know partly those talking about those challenges um and i i also could relate to this because a lot of times when when you start working on a project when you you know you're new in in analytics uh, workforce and you you're like okay let's do regression on this a lot of things that we uh, you know uh, from from my experience i'm saying is you you don't know um if if you don't understand what you're trying to achieve you basically don't know what all uh, is going into it or at least what what should go into it because you know what your outcome variable is going to be um, maybe let's see let's talk about from an example perspective if i'm trying to predict um what the sales is going to be i need to understand like you know what are the drivers of uh, sale for for a product um and then uh, i think a lot of times that the the second one is you know making mistakes of what are the assumptions being made or in other words uh, knowing what the assumptions are for a linear regression for uh, or for a logistic regression not keeping those things in mind for a very simple one i think being the normality of the outcome variable or for the predictors um where if if you understand that piece you would know if your uh, if your predictors or if your outcome variable is not normally distributed you want you understand that you have to probably do a log transformation uh, and i think very commonly this is seen with income variables um and uh, even i think count related variables like uh, 
direct footprint to an ATM or things like that. Um, so again, um, what goes into your estimation process or what data is needed, um, what assumptions are, uh, you know, uh, uh, are, are being made for, for this particular um, instance of regression that you're running. Um, these are very important and often um, overlooked, I feel. Uh, and then they also talk about how estimates and predictions are interpreted is um, which uh, in, in a classical or Bayesian framework uh, and our focus, I think our preference is classical framework. Uh, but what this really means is I think from the output perspective. So when you get the results, um, like we, we run in our, uh, you know, we, we run LM function or something to within R or maybe in, uh, in Python, um, whatever leads to uh, that, that getting the model output, um, let's say for from sklearn. Uh, being able to analyze uh, the the uh, object which which contains the results, um, I think that also is uh, at times a challenge. Um, and that's about it. So now I think I'll go back and I'll look at. Sorry about this. Uh, can you see my? I think you can't see the big query that I just opened up accidentally. <laughs> Just the presentation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want to, I'm going to switch my screen to this examples. Yeah. And uh, so I'm sharing this uh, online uh, version of this chapter. Can you see this? Okay, and yeah, I think uh, like I was saying earlier, I probably want to invite people to start uh, discussing this uh, within within section 1.4. Um, I probably pause quickly for each um, uh, heading. So he talks about um, regression to estimate a relationship of interest, where uh, we want this. This is an example of comparing treatment versus control groups, and. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to explain these specific graphs in this example. So this is more or less a hypothetical linear and non-linear model generation. Um, I guess I, I'll start with, with a basic, a very simple explanation of, you know, how you would read this um, a, a regression chart like this. So uh, in, in the first, uh, in the left-hand side scenario, we have, uh, uh, we're looking at discrete uh, results for control and treatment groups. So this is the outcome measurement, and we're looking at the results for a control group like the you know like so. And uh, the regression, if 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 a regression is built upon based on values you know like this, you, it would try to fit um, a straight line uh, based on you know how the results are seen, um, but. Um, a, a regression like on on a continuous uh, spectrum uh, for for continuous variables uh, would look something like this. So if your treatment levels uh, are continuous variables, is a continuous variable, uh, you know, or in in more practical ways, this is how you would uh, you know use uh, a continuous uh, variable scenario where you're, you're trying to build. Uh, so, sorry, let me rephrase. Um, so if you have X and Y variables uh, and you want to find a relationship between how is Y being calculated uh, or how is Y changing based off of one unit change in X. Oh, this is going back to my previous definition. I think I, I missed this part. So when I was saying the economics definition of regression is, uh, or econometrics is, um, uh, is finding the relationship between, you know, two, uh, between a, between an independent variable, uh, sorry, with relationship of a dependent variable based on one or more independent variables. Uh, and what that really means is you're trying to find out how much of a unit change in one variable is going to, uh, impact the, uh, the, the outcome variable and set risk paribus and which, which basically means keeping everything else constant. Uh, that's that's typically the you know the, the economics part of it the centrist paribus uh, which uh, 
you know as again i was saying to, going back to the the amateur part of it which we don't uh, you know uh, tend to understand all the time so what that means is even if i'm doing a multiple linear regression you know and we look at the parameter values at each value what that represents is the impact that you know for example um hypothetically uh, if i'm trying to find out income based on uh, the height and weight of uh, you know each record that i have so if uh, height has a parameter value of let's say 30 you know it's a, it's a hypothetical example so with that what what that really means uh, is that every unit change in height of you know whatever um, unit you are taking at that point uh, it is going to uh, increase an increase because it's positive it's going to increase the income by 30 units um i hope that made sense okay thank you for some nods <laughs> um okay and um, yeah so these non linear anyone please volunteer to explain these um i, I can do that <clears throat> thank you so um when you've got non-linear treatment what you have is if you put a straight line through it it doesn't minimize the sum of squares so when we're looking at two for instance uh, x and y variable what we're trying to do is uh, when we put a regression through something is we're trying to minimize the squared dis variance or squared distances so um the parameters that we use in order to calculate a uh, regression line are dependent on trying to find minimal between those two uh, covariants. Um, with a non-linear uh, relationship, you want to give an extra degree of freedom so that you've got some flexibility in the modeling process. And so what you do is you throw in uh, what we might call, um, in, some, in some aspects of modeling, you might call it a spline or in other ways, you might just call it a degree of freedom. And what that does is it allow, to, allow us to put what we might call a knot or a line at a certain point in the um, in the line of best fit, as you might call it, and that will then follow the trend along. And that's essentially what you see here. So we see the the knot seems to be placed around about two, and then the rest of the line just follows down with the same slope. Uh, whereas if you just put a straight line through it you will still get a, uh, a relationship which you can say is, well, the coefficient of as treatment level increases, then the outcome measure decreases, as you see in the left-hand uh, graph. <clears throat> but it's not as good at minimizing those, uh, those variances. And therefore, your actual, if you don't have the extra degree of freedom, then what happens is you've got a less accurate model. And that becomes more and more important when you start adding in additional layers or additional factors. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so I think we can now move to the second example, but I also wanted to check Pavitra, we, uh, we are like 30 minutes in now. So do you want to um, start with the exercises or want to continue, maybe finish this discussion? All right, so yeah, I, I don't know, what, what is everyone's choice? I think, uh, I think we are, this is a good thing to do, right? Because we are able to discuss as Priyanka is speaking. So, yeah. I, uh, what do you think, um, Mikhail? You have any thoughts or? Um, yeah, I, I think it's better to first finish the material first, right? Okay. Okay. And then discuss as anything comes along. I don't know what others think. Because well, Priyanka has made the prepared for the material, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, so the, you know, all that I had to say, I'm pretty much done. Uh, it was this examples, I like I was saying in the beginning, I, I thought and I felt comfortable, you know, having everyone like chime in and um, discuss uh, what, what these examples, uh, sort of how they understand these, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So anybody else volunteering for this one? Oh, I can bring up this text. Sure. I, I, think, um, I think in this particular case, um, what happens is the interaction term is basically saying that um, by uh, if someone smokes, then that causes an additional effect in the regression. 
and therefore the line changes so instead of having one line of best fit you put multiple through it yeah. and so well that's what it shows here but in reality is um if you go back up to the one the one before and you see the top line so you see that when we see um in the top left cop uh, graph that there's a slight there's, there's an increase for the treatment versus control group well we're just simply when we go back down to the other one we're simply just applying that to that extra level so when we're considering the regression slope line we have to make allowances for that additional level so it's a bit like adding just factor levels into your model um smokers versus non-smokers factor level and our you know two betas sorry our uh, y value is lung probability of lung cancer and then radon exposure is simply our measure so then when we throw in those two factor levels as to whether someone smokes or not that will then change the slope of the line depending on the condition. Makes sense. Um, so on this, I think I wanted to um, sort of um, have uh, other uh, other people's ideas and in general and, and specifically if, if it's not a healthcare project that you're working on. Um, so how do you tend to find out about interaction? I mean, is it because, I mean, you would know it uh, with the context that you, you know, the problem that you are working in, is it, uh, or, or I don't know, I mean, how do you find out about the fact that you might have an interaction or you need to account for something like this? That's a really good question. I think uh, I have seen some people create that matrix of uh, covariates. And what you do is that you look to see if the sum total, I mean, if, if uh, you're looking at just the interaction of one or two, but then um, how does that work? If, if you have um, an effect just with one variable and then you add another one, and if either there is a, a synergy or if it changes, um, because I know I, I attended this uh, feature engineering talk, but it was in Python and they can create, and I think we can do it in ours in GG Galley or something in, um, in R, but there they could create a grid of, uh, of all the covariates. And then they could look at the, uh, you know, like uh, how they both sort of interacted with uh, each other, like how, whether it was synergistic or no change, or if it went down. And I, you can you can just do like a brute force thing and then you can hone in and then pick pick those covariates and and actually test your your numbers there because that's more of a you know like a, a brute force uh, approach but yeah that's that's i think that's like a big part of a lot of uh, python uh, workbooks and the kaggle competitions is like looking at interactions and how you can actually look at variables that either track together or you know like not collinear, but then how they uh, they impact each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've, I've seen this in, in text a lot, uh, you know, like, because again, within this example, you, you're, um, if, if you don't do this, your, um, you know, your, your line of best foot would look very different. It would be probably uh, with an intercept of non-smoker going to the, uh, going up to the, you know, on the right hand side, going up here, high uh, to trying to get that line of best fit because you know to count for um, all these variations but it your your r square would be less your accuracy would be you know much much lower um, but if you do it, it now in in this case for example we know that, that there is definitely uh, we can you know obviously visually see there is a clearly uh, different behavior and hence uh, I believe the R square would get better. The model is much robust in this case, but like, what so if you don't know also, those things? And yeah, is this also a definition of a confounder? Like, I don't yeah. know if you guys know of confounders where you can actually stratify based on groups. Because I mean, like, if you didn't think about this and you um, and you just put them all together, then the 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 uh, the line of best fit would be like different, right? Like, you wouldn't actually see that partition. So. Yeah. Like the, the aspect, whether they are smokers or not, like that, that could be a confounder, isn't it? Because it's, uh, it's, it's exerting an effect on the outcome, but um, how does a confounder work? Um, well, um, I think a confounder affects both the exposure and the outcome. Yeah, I think so. If it only 
if it, if it only affects uh, one of the two, I would say maybe a mediator. I think you're right. I think you're right. So I'm guessing that we can't actually say that of a smoker and the radon mm. or radon exposure. I think I think that is correct. <coughs> yeah, I, you're 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 right, Mikhail. It would have to affect both because it's kind of like that, isn't it? Like it would impact both your. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. that's true. Okay. Yeah. True. And regarding the interaction, um, I'm not entirely well. I think if we already have um, the data set handed to us, or maybe we download um, a data from somewhere, maybe it is a good idea indeed to explore the data by having uh, those pair plots. But um, if we are really um, set out to do a study, I think pre-specifying -spe pre which interactions, which variables that you think will interact would always be a good thing because especially if you're talking to psychologists, well, I'm not a psychologist, but um, I know for sure that they are really careful about um, which interactions are you looking for. Have you like pre-specified of the interactions? Because I think interactions like many of um, associations can be quite spurious and the interpretation can be confusing at times. Maybe like here, the example is quite nice, but if you're uh, doing um, interaction analysis of tons of variables. I'm not, I will not be surprised that you can find something there, but what can you make out of it? I'm not sure. I think this is yeah. where a little bit of subject matter expertise always comes in handy. Like, I mean, everyone says that data, you can just go in and wrangle it, but I, I think that that context is so important. Sorry, I think I cut you off, Kevin, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to add, uh, no worries. I, I was just going to add uh, to Mikhail. Mikhail, is that how you pronounce your name, sir? Okay. Um, yeah. Mikhail's uh, point about, um, like, I think, yeah, there's, there's like, cases where you have a data-driven, driven, like, approach where you're, you find some different effects for different groups, but also you have, like, a theory or domain knowledge where you're coming into the, uh, the, the situation and you're asking a question that requires an interaction to answer, you know, to testing a modeling of an interaction. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that uh, about the spurious point um, is that, yeah, for each like level that you're, you're, you're including in the model for an interaction, you're, you're basically reducing your sample size for each of those groups. Right. So it's like, you're testing the effect for each of those groups. And so if you don't have enough data and there's only like a couple of points for a particular group, like non-smokers or something, then um, you have like less power in that case. Yeah. So anyway, just saying that, yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, so this is again, hypothetical causal treatment. Um, this is similar to the example that I guess I was hypothetically creating. Uh, anyone wants to talk about this? No? Okay, I think here um, uh, they pointed out um, that we should try to approach this regression coefficients in a less causal manner, right? Because I think, well, at least from um, uh, many statistical books that I've um, uh, skimmed, well, uh, I don't claim that I read uh, thoroughly everything. Um, I think uh, many book will uh, explain regression uh, coefficient by saying that, well, if you have uh, one unit change of this um, coefficient, then you will have um, beta increase or decrease of your predictors, like what you said before, Priyanka. And yeah, when they pointed out um, about um, the fact that such interpretation is actually a causal claim between the uh, predictors and response, I would say they're really right about that. But it's just, I think I took those teachings really um, without any critical thinking. Well, not that I um, know a lot about this, but I think it's it's only a short paragraph, but I think it's a very important reminder. 
Um, Mikhail, I also I agree with your point. It feels to me like the this whole first chapter and, and this seems to be the whole approach of the book is that that it's about critical thinking um, about statistics, which is you know not a lot of books actually take that angle, which I think is great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, agree. I mean, uh, you know, like starting with the challenges and starting with, you know, challenging the the assumptions and you know saying how and did do you understand it? Well, you know how to interpret and how to check the regression models, all those things like that come up in every every other section. Kind of drives that point. Yeah, I like how it's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, 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 Kevin, go ahead. I was just gonna add to, to, to the points that, raised, uh, that I like how it's structured around like um, problems of practice, you know, uh, rather than like techniques. And I think that's really useful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I still um, somehow question though on, on this section. I mean, I, I understand their approach, but again, I'm still thinking or I think I'm not too convinced saying that it's incorrect when I when I make that statement that you know this these many units change in X is leading to a unit change in Y or the other way around. But what again, I think it goes back to the the fact that context is also important and knowing that it's not X is not the only uh, the independent variable here. Which is why, it, you know, giving that Y to X relationship is not right. Uh, so there is a reason why it's not, it's not accurate, but it's not incorrect. You know what I mean? So I think that's why I'm not, I'm not so sure I kind of agree with this piece, but I know it's not, it's not right when I'm saying Y is equal to MX plus C, right? Then M is, let's say five, five X plus eight, but it's again, it's not, it's inaccurate. It's not incorrect as such. Anybody I think um, one of the ways to think about this is the, um, the example of Nobel Prize winners and uh, chocolate, which is that chocolate isn't actually a predictor of Nobel Prizes. It's just associated with, um, with the amount of money that a country has within its educational system. Although slightly loosely, that does have an impact. So if countries are more affluent and they have more money, they do tend to spend more on their educational systems as well. And that tends to produce um, the kind of minds that are more likely to get, um, well, not just the kind of minds that are going to get uh, Nobel Prizes, but also the educational systems that promote systems that allow people to do the work that cause them to be Nobel Prize winners. So the, all those things kind of combine together. So what it's trying to say is at the top is um it's saying you've got to be careful about for instance the confidence intervals of your um of your prediction the more you can reduce that the better um but then there are spurious associations that we might say well it seems slightly intuitive so uh we might say that for instance uh you know if we were talking about height and earnings you know for basketball players it probably make a lot more sense than it would do for say someone who plays golf you know, if we talk about payment or that, or someone who works at a computer. But um, in this particular case, it's not particularly very good. So we just have to consider how, what we're measuring, even if it does have some kind of significance, whether it is actually something that is truly affecting our model or whether there's something else associated with that. Okay. Yeah, so I think when you start on giving an example, spurious correlation was what came to my mind, but then you, you had a, you know, other thought reasonable thought to it. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a fair point. Yeah, and, and I think, and oh, sorry. Yeah. In this in this specific example, you know, if you stratified the sample according to gender, um, you might see that, um, you know, being male is probably a better predictor of earnings um, than height. And those two things tend to be correlated with one another. point. Kevin, you want to add something? Oh, I was just gonna say, going back to your point, Bianca, about, um, about like, 
the correctness. Uh, I think it's interesting. Like, I think there's a difference between um, finding a coefficient that minimizes uh, error, right? Like for this particular model that you're fitting, but that that isn't the same thing as the true relationship or the true causal structure. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So like the model isn't like, it did the thing that you asked, asked it to do, you know, finding the coefficient that minimizes the error for your data set, but only under certain conditions does that say something about what causes what or, uh, or uh, um, what the true relationship is from like a, I guess, a, I don't know, a causal or philosophical standpoint, I guess. Um, and then, and then, yeah, if there's problems of representation or, sample size or whatever, then it'll lead to problems with like generalizing to a new population or a new data set, but yeah. Um. Right, so that's what to be it, yeah. And yeah, that's all. So after that, uh, this, 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 we, I, you know, gave a very brief summary on this one. And after that, we have the calculation base, which is again, mostly given in stand. So I, I didn't really have anything on that side except for the heading. Um, and again, uh, it, it is all mentioned that, you know, further details of this are, are really given in the following chapters. So there isn't really, I don't think there's any point of discussing the, how the calculation. And again, these are just our functions or methods um, that, if anyone is interested that we can look at, but I guess we all know one or the other functions that we tend to use. So um, I think that that should be all from the text perspective. I guess we can move over to the exercises or who, who wants to start, Pavitra, you want to do or Mikhail? So I'll stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, Priyanka. You have to drop off, Kevin. Yeah, sorry, I have an appointment I have to go to, but um, but no problem. Thanks for the presentation, uh, and I haven't really met. I I've met most of you, most of you, but uh, excited for the future meetings. Thank you. Yeah. Glad hey, you can join us Kevin. before Kevin, like unofficially or well, virtually. Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen you a lot of you in the Slack group, so uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll see you next week. Bye. See you, Kevin. Uh, okay, so I had volunteered for 1.1 and 1.9, and I have to say that I had a total like a brain freeze, and I uh, did not actually make much progress in the exercises, but I went totally segued into something else. So my apologies, because I didn't actually do what I said I would do. So initially, I, ha- I was going to do 1.1 and 1.9. And uh, let's just quickly take a look. I mean, I, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I won't use up a lot of time. But uh, one second. So the 1.1 chapter, I mean, exercise was basically looking at that helicopter uh, example. And then um, they want you to propose a design but that you think will maximize the helicopter's expected time aloft. It's not necessary for you to fit a formal regression model here, but you should think about the general concerns of regression. And I have to say that I did not know what to do. So I went ahead and pulled the data in. Um, so this is, heli- you guys can see my screen, right? You can see my R studio session? Yes, you can. Okay, yeah, so then I pulled that in and then um, I just, you know, I just started out by like just looking at the data set and we know what that looks like. So it's basically broken up into uh, just multiple iterations of uh, the ID one and then um, you have ID two and the amount of time it spends suspended in the air. So, I mean, and this is like so completely insanely like weird because I, I tried creating a scatter, like I wanted to just check for length versus time and uh, width versus time for each one of those, and then use the group as your helicopter ID. But it was it was like it was one value, right? So like they just sort of like ended up. Um, sorry, I have to knit this. Uh, they just ended up like stacking on each other. So I it's it was not what I wanted to see. But uh, I don't know what what like does anyone have any ideas like what you could do with something like this? But if you're if you're trying to like look for how you can maximize. Um, sorry, I have a problem here with my GLM net. Um, method is LM. I'm gonna go ahead and take out the 
this is what I was trying to do next, and I'll get to that in just a sec. I'm gonna go ahead and mute this. So, uh, yeah, so I just pulled up. Um, so the first one was just like dropping the data as this, like a, just like a table. And here, okay, I, I feel almost like embarrassed to show people this plot because I, uh, I was um, trying to see. You see your, uh, oh, yeah, you can't. Okay, sorry. I think I should have shared the screen. So sorry about that. Screen. Okay, can you see my, uh, the knitted, uh, our markdown. Yeah. So yes. I, I tried to plot like length against time and then width against time and, and really it ended up looking so weird. So I just kind of gave up at this point. Like, I mean, admittedly, I didn't try very hard, but if you, if, if you want to propose a design where you can maximize your expected time, how, how do you even do that? Like, I mean, what, what are they, what, are they, what is it that they want you to do? Like, I felt like I was totally lost in what, how to even approach this question. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, could you elaborate on the question first? Because sure. I can't really yeah. follow. No problem. So it says first graph your data. Okay, so that's what I did. Like, I mean, graph meaning I just like dumped it into a table. And then I thought I would look at the two parameters that drive the time that the, that the helicopter actually stays afloat. So like width is one and length is one. And I would, um, I would, I would just look at time across like length and time across width and then segregated based on uh, helicopter one or helicopter two. And you really don't see much because um, they're all like just stacked up on each other like this. So you can't, you can't really tell. So if you want to propose- Is it that both, both the helicopters have the same length and for whatever time they are in uh, flight, I mean, yeah, the length won't change, right? Yeah, so I think one way to do that, maybe I could um, do a color. I could probably do a color instead of uh, yeah, for the ID. Yeah, so let me do that. Color is, and let's see if that looks any different. Okay, so that won't show to you. Okay, let's try that. Helicopter ID. So is it OUR or? You have con to convert the ID to factor, I guess. Okay, so is, yeah. ah, you're right. Okay, so as factor, is that what it is? As dot no, factor? As dot factor. Yeah. As dot factor, oh, okay. That makes sense. An extra bracket. Yeah, so. As dot factor. You didn't add the extra. Oh, I think I didn't have, okay, yeah. Zero, shift zero. Yeah. Exactly right. Okay. Color is off. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. That's that's awesome. So, um, and you can see that like so that's uh, ID one, right? So that's your helicopter one and helicopter two, and so they they like pretty much track. And I think these guys have more that are like in common. So I think each of them had like eight different one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different like iterations or eight different iterations. And these are just kind of stacked on top of the other. So I tried doing like uh, length by time and width by time. But frankly, what they are saying is that Propose a design that is wing width and length that you think will maximize the helicopter's expected time aloft so like how you can uh, increase this so i don't know if you go from the maximum value of that and then like maybe use the value of uh, that as your length and width i like i didn't know like well, I, I practically thinking i'm thinking will i mean the length and the width of an uh, helicopter will not change Will it? Well, it's a paper. Because, um, okay, let's look at the data again. Yeah, so it's, um, so this is your helicopter ID and then this is your width and this is the length. Okay, so, uh, and so they just have like different, uh, they've done, so this is your uh, helicopter one. So that's, that's the same for each ID. So let's go back to the R Studio session. Uh, our studio. 
So here, if you look at the, it's for, for helicopter ID2, it's 4.6 and 8, 8.2. And the other one, it's, oh, it's the same thing actually. Yeah, it's the same thing. I, I somehow thought that they were different, but they're actually the same thing. Well, suffice to say, I didn't really, um, I could not come up with any anything to propose there. So I then um, decided to try my hand at something else. So I looked at the Hibs election data. So if you guys look at uh, figure 1.1, 1 .1, on mm -hmm. the left, you have the, the forecasting. The actual so, data. Yeah, yeah, and then the left is the actual, the, the, the linear prediction. So I tried to tidy model that. So first I went in and I got my data and um, then I added the data in. So let's run that. And it basically looks like this. So you have the, the, the growth, which is your, um, uh, the growth, which is your dependent, uh, excuse me, growth, which is your independent. And then you have the vote, which is the, the dependent. Right. Yeah, so the vote is the is the dependent variable, and um, you I think it's about sixteen rows or something like that. So uh, I read that data in, and then um, I don't know why. Uh, I guess they have used GLM net because of the I, I mean Stan GLM because of the priors. Like he, I, I looked at one of the tidyverse. Uh, I think uh, Ben Baumers, and he gets into all of this thing about priors. So clearly they are like you know they're clearly looking at the Bayesian angle of things and I don't, I don't understand Bayesian statistics as well. So when I tried, um, so I created the recipe. So my recipe was just vote, vote um, and, and then the, that, that being the dependent, this is the independent, this is my data. And then I set the outcome and predictors. And then here in this case, I just use the entire data set because it's so small. Um, so I went ahead and prepped the recipe. So all of that was fine. And then instead of using GLM net, um, I used LM because I, you know, it's just more intuitive to me. So that, that part was fine. I did try it with GLM net and I got some weird matrix error, which I don't know. Then I created a little workflow with just the recipe and then added the, um, I mean, I don't need to do a penalty, et cetera. I was trying out that because I was initially going the, down the path of the GLM net thing. So for linear regression and for just straight linear regression, uh, uh, linear model, I don't really need to do that. So when I did this, actually it did work with just LM. So I could, um, let me go ahead and knit this so you can see it. I could not get GLM net to work though. I, I got some weird matrix error, which I do not understand. So when I tried it, um, it actually did work. I got the recipe to uh, work. And then if we go and take a look at uh, the final, one second. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, console, let's take a look at final underscore mod. And you can see it comes back with something pretty similar. You, you guys can see my studio session, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like it comes back with something pretty similar to what they had there. The intercept was 46.25. I think they got 46.3 with mm -hmm. uh, the stand, stand GLM. And then the growth was 3.06 with the with this um, method. So, um, I mean, admittedly, like I I thought that the GLM net was a bit of an overkill. Like, when would one use a GLM versus um, like an LM for something like this? Like, is it? Um, yeah, I I mean, I didn't I did not know why. And of course, they talk about the median and the MAD. I mean, I think uh, median, I think we know that. So MADs are really good. It's the mean actual deviation. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, median and MAD. I think the MAD is really good if you have a lot of uh, outliers in your data set, I believe. Like it's, it's more conservative in that sense. And anyone who's stronger in statistics, please feel free to jump in and tell me that I'm totally wrong. But um, yeah, so they did have uh, two parameters here. The median. So yeah, so like, you know how we take the median, right? Because we want to avoid the whole skewing of data if you have outliers. The MAD is kind of like that. It's, um, it's, it helps you to like keep away from uh, overestimating or underestimating your mean because of skewed data. Is this correct, you guys? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 
I think so. So um, the math stands for, I think, median of absolute deviation. So it's the distance, yeah. uh, the absolute distance between every data points to the median in the data. Yep. So you calculate the distance to the median and then you take the median distance out of all those um, right. measures. So it's not like standard deviation where you're squaring it, right? Because there you no. are actually, you actually square it and then take, uh, get the average and then you take the square root here you actually take the absolute values and so you're not like going to blow up like things where you have like one outlier which is going to blow up that entire thing just because you've squared that that difference here it's it's the absolute uh, distance yeah so i think mads work better when you have a skewed data which of course in this case was not um, necessary but um I don't know. So I, um, I thought that this was fine. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about the tidy tidification of this? Uh, August, what did you think about this? You think it looks okay? Um, to be honest, I was actually reading the uh, question on the helicopters at the time. Oh. Um, um, just to <laughs> yeah. go back to the helicopters, though, um, yeah. the reason why it doesn't work is because actually they seem to be asking us to... Uh, actually conduct our own experiment and then record that data. So that's perhaps why uh, we're not actually getting anything useful there. Gotcha, okay. Okay, maybe you're right. So perhaps try it out with different uh, widths and lengths and, and see what, what you find, like just actually do an experiment with that, I see, okay. I am okay. quite interested in how to interpret uh, these Bayesian regressions though, because uh, they seem, quite different to the parameters I'm used to. Because uh, typically speaking, I will either deal with uh, ARIMA kind of modeling or with, mm -hmm. uh, with neural nets. And none of that really involves uh, this kind of Bayesian analysis. Uh, and even if it does, like um, uh, Bayesian structural time series analysis tends to oh. give out pretty simple, I mean, pretty easy to read responses. Whereas this is kind of, quite different in terms of the what do these parameters mean what do the parameters mean yeah that's true, that's true. um maybe they get onto it later yeah i think we are probably getting a lot out of this well i'll also say this though 1.9 where they actually give you the problem so consider the helicopter design from 1.1 and then you construct 25 helicopters measure their falling times fit a linear model and they actually give you the formula that you can use um, and then use the fitted model time to estimate the values. Like, is there any way to actually specify a formula going into a prediction? Uh, can, you, can you actually say what you want the formula to be or does the model do it for you? So I was not quite sure if they were already using this. Um, like, is, is that fair game to like do it that way? Yeah, well, I mean, that's what you do when you model anyway. So whenever you build a model, you're, um, you're essentially building the coefficients. Um, it just doesn't look like that. So in R, when you say add all nominal, you're just, you know, the, the whole beta term and then adding a time symbol to create a um, interaction term. Well, that's just the coding version of doing the same thing. Gotcha, okay. Um, the difference is, or what the impression I got, which we kind of like breezed over earlier is differences in the frequentist approach, what we do is we collect data and assume that the parameters don't change. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the, um, in the Bayesian approach, we assume that the parameters change as information is updated, which is why mm -hmm. when we collect our priors, even if, we, particularly if we've got like data from, sci uh, from some scientific journal from previous research, we can then update upon that. Um, whereas, um, so what we often are doing with Bayesian approach is basically iterating lots of bootstrap samples in order to uh, create a replication of the experiment several, yeah. dozen, several times in order to improve the quality of our regression. Got it. Okay, yeah. But that doesn't mean I understand the parameters. <laughs> So why would this approach fail though? 1.9a, why would this approach fail? And then use the fitted model time to estimate the values of wing width and body length that will maximize your expected time aloft. So is it because like 25 helicopters is not really representative or like? Uh, 
it's because the things that they actually recommend that you're changing are things like the number of folds, et cetera, but not actually, you, they're, tell, they're literally telling you don't change the width and the, and the length. That's the main thing that you're meant to keep constant. So that um, those parameters wouldn't actually improve, sorry, help you to predict anything. Oh, really? They okay. stay the same. Or oh, that's my interpretation. I could be completely wrong. I'm more than happy to uh, hear other thoughts on that. Hmm. Hmm. I think so. Um, in the uh, model that they have here, there. So we are. So we are using the width and length to predict the um, the time the helicopter stay afloat, right? And then afterwards, we try to fit the. We try to use the fitted time to predict the width and the length. But yes. the problem with the latter one, I think, is because then we. Um, well, if you look there in the first term, first formula term, there's the um, irreducible error and also reducible um, error of the model um, because maybe um, linear regression cannot really capture the relation be uh, between width and length to the time. And then because we are only take the fitted model time, then we're basically sort of losing all the variations along the fitted line and then maybe, um, yeah, we will be biased if you're using the predicted time to predict the width and the length because we are losing those um, error um, in the middle of the route. That's what I think. Hmm. Am I making any sense? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, you, no, are, I, you are sort of making sense. And I, I think this would have been easier if we'd actually done the experiment. Um, <laughs> because I think what, what they're getting at is the thing that's important with the helicopters is the actual area of the wings, um, which is a function of both width and length. Um, and so the, the, those, two, those two variables are are, are they're dependent on one another, um, which is why I think having them in two different terms in the model um, doesn't isn't the most effective way. Like that's true, and maybe to August's point, perhaps there are other parameters like um, the number of folds or whatever, right? I mean, like we haven't actually even looked at anything else that 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 could be a potential. Um, and also the weight of the helicopter, because the yeah. bigger the wings, then it's below, it will be heavier, right? True, and like she says, it's the yeah. area. Yeah, yeah, right. No, but the, the weight should be constant because you're getting you're using the same amount of paper. Oh, mm. ah. So the yeah, so the weight is the constant. The design is constant because the number of folds it says are the yeah. same. The body width and length are, are constants. Um, it's only the the wing width and length that are variables. Um, and they are they are related to one another that, because when you multiply the width with the length, you get the area. That's a good point, yes. You're so, right. yeah, so I think, you know, like linear regression doesn't quite fit here. I'm not sure how, what the best thing is to fit, but it's not just in one. Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem here is um, we'd need to actually conduct the experiment and collect the data um, because it doesn't yes. really help with understanding. Uh, Denise is entirely right as well, which is the way it should stay the same. The only thing that is really changing are, it seems to be something to do with the folds, which impacts the wings or something like that, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's some great points right there. Um, Okay, well, if anyone can uh, come up with why the GLM net part here doesn't work, because I got some matrix error, I'm gonna post this in the Slack channel, but I'm, uh, for each session, I'm also gonna try and tidy, tidy model one of those exercises. I, I mean, all the worked examples, one of those two. Did you um, actually um, then tune it? 
because you've put tune in there. But, um, well, no, that's because initially I was going to do a GLM net and I couldn't get that to work. So I don't think for linear regression, there's like any penalty, right? Like there's no hyperparameter tuning here. I don't believe at least. You can, you can do, uh, oh, sorry, for GLM, there's not a uh, lambda. Yeah, for lambda, but for LM. Uh, you, can, you can add a lambda into a linear oh. model. Oh, you could add that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, um, I, they discuss it better in Introduction to Statistical Modeling. So, uh, statistical Learning, sorry. Um, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Got but, it. Okay. Lambda penalizations are used throughout modeling. And you can use it even with uh, LM. Okay, so that's uh, that is interesting, and I should try and see if I can actually get figure that part out. So let me look at um, lambda. So uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm not. Oh. I got it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I'm not very well versed with R. So I was wondering when you say penalties, is some kind of regularization? when you mention lambda or it's what is that? Oh, so it's um, for, so August, I could be wrong. I'm not quite sure what it is for LM, but normally with, uh, let's say you're doing, um, let's say K-fold uh, uh, cross validate. I, I mean, let's say you're doing um, K-means where you're trying to figure out how many, like you're doing a clustering uh, model, right? You're, you're a classification mm -hmm. model. And you know, K there is how many clusters you want. So you don't want to be overfitting it, but at the same time, you don't want it to be that simplistic that you're underfitting either. So that particular K, which determines how many clusters you want to start with, that, that is mm -hmm. called hyperparameter tuning, where you can start with one and, and then you can, you can go over the entire gamut and then figure out which one mm -hmm. uh, is, is like the best hyperparameter. So it's different from parameters, but uh, a hyperparameter is also uh, connected to like model tuning and, and refining how your model uh, functions. Uh, and so with things like GLM, et cetera, I think the penalty is, uh, is part of the hyperparameter tuning here. Uh, is that correct, uh, guys, who are better well-versed in stats than I am? Um, I'm not sure about better. Um, <laughs> so my, my uh, question was mainly like, uh, so for regression, there are ridge regression, lasso regression, where you penalize size of Ws or squares of size of Ws. So I, I was wondering whether you were talking about that or something else. Yeah, I think that is um, lambda penalizations are often like, you know, a really good example is when, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I can't remember what you said about the clustering, but like, if you add loads of, um, like with a lasso regression, it is basically based similarly off linear modeling. If you're adding in loads and loads of um, predictors in order to help mm -hmm. you, um, you know, solve, a, you know, like for, uh, some kind of problem, um, you know, it goes into clustering, I suppose, as well. Um, then you need to be penalize your model for the amount of information you're adding in, because when you add in more information, it will inherently just take up more of the residuals and explain more variance, even if it's not particularly helping the model. You're throwing in more and more stuff, and it will just pick up by um, as a consequence of just randomness, pick up yeah. some of that noise. Yeah, so you have to realize. Sorry, Ex like explaining noise, noise in the uh, uh, train data. Yeah, but but the thing is, is because you're just throwing in information, the information could be completely wrong. You, uh, what you need to do is penalize your mo penalize the model for adding more and more uh, predictors, um, in order to make sure that it's not overfitting, and mm -hmm. that's why you want to put a lambda penalization. Yeah, does that, yeah. Does that make sense? I'm not yeah, very good yeah. at explaining this. No, that was really good. Well, um, I'm going to have to run you guys. I'm uh, probably, I think everyone needs to get back to work. But I, uh, I think this was, this was good, right? This was a good session. And thanks so much, Priyanka, for presenting. Yeah, sure. Oh, but there was one more exercise. Uh, Mikhail, did you want to do it now? Or maybe we should continue the exercises next time? So um, have we agreed like how long will each session be? Is it one hour? I think the usual is one hour, but then now we are, over <laughs> we are over time yeah, for 20 yeah. minutes now. So, yeah. No, but I think yeah. one is better.
and sustainable. Yeah, that is very true. Um, I also just make a suggestion because I've just looked I've looked forward to some of the the exercises in the next chapter um but whether because especially in this first chapter a lot of the exercises and questions are, are quite conceptual and they're not so much um having to do with code um and we might um you know maybe we should have a tab on the spreadsheet where we actually just um give our conceptual answers um, so that even if we don't get a chance to discuss it in the in the group, um, we've got you know we've got some examples from um, from things that we can um, you know capture and or look at um, mm. in our own time. Um, should I um, actually make a Google Doc for that? So well, because for my question, I book um, question uh, one point three and one point four, and they are indeed all conceptual and I mean I can um, put my answers there and you can chime in because you can add comments in Google Docs right yeah uh, yes all right and maybe if you have uh, more examples you can also put it there so I think that's a good um, suggestion was it Janita Janita that was speaking Janita okay thank you Okay, so, well, next week will be my turn to present then, I guess. Sure. Cool, I'm sorry I took up so much time, you guys. I really am. Oh, it's okay. Oh, learning, isn't it? Uh, I think it was a good discussion. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, see you all next week then, I guess. All right, bye guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Later, guys.